greetings and welcome to an educational otherwise an occasional conversation series where we dream together in public about teaching and learning for collective futures. I am Django Paris and I am grateful to be joining you here from these beautiful Coast Salish lands. I am currently at the Bank Center for Educa Educational Justice uh, in the College of Education at the University of Washington. And I am very excited to be joined by four wonderful people um, really brilliant educators, uh, scholars, community organizers, and um, community folks, community members. And also it happens to be four people that I've learned a lot from in the past uh, four or five years. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining us and, uh, and thinking with us today. Um, we have with us Shanae Washington, who is an assistant professor of equity and justice in teacher education here at the University of Washington and also affiliate faculty in the Bank Center for Educational Justice and core faculty with me in the Culturally Sustaining Ed program. So Shanae and I get to um, work and learn together uh, quite a lot. We also have Kayla Mendoza Chu, who serves as the community partner liaison for the Education Communities and Organizations undergraduate program here at the University of Washington. So a colleague and a friend as well. Uh, we have Jessica Ramirez, uh, an assistant professor in social work at and uh, Chicanx and Latinx studies at Portland State University. Um, so when I got to know um, over, over your years when you were here in Seattle. And we have Caleb Germanaro, uh, who's an assistant professor of critical pedagogies and urban education at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and also really appreciated my time learning with you. So it really feels like I'm talking um, with a group of friends, which is my favorite conversations to have. So really grateful to you all. So I thought we might start by thinking a little bit about this beautiful project that you all um, recently published uh, in the uh, journal Equity and Excellence in Education. And the article is entitled, It's a Vibe, uh, Belonging, Healing, and Liberation in Community Spaces by Us and for Us. And I should mention to anybody that's listening or watching, um, it's an open access article. So really check it out, take advantage of that. Thought it would be a wonderful um, chance to think about this project with you all. In the article, you write about, quote, the self-determining work of Black and other people of the global majority who have curated by us, for us, community spaces of belonging, healing, and liberation. And so I thought maybe um, you could tell us a little bit about the project, your all collaboration on the project. Um, and also to describe some of the community spaces that kind of are the, the center um, of this work, like Nurturing Roots and The Root of Us, some of those spaces um, and people that you learned with. So Shanae, maybe you could get us started and then we'll just see, see how we can go here. Mm -hmm. Yep. So first, uh, I just want to say thank you, Django, for inviting us to be here uh, today and for this opportunity to talk about this work that we are all super proud of. Um, and so our study was actually one in about eight um, projects under a research project on reducing barriers to educational justice in Washington state. Uh, the Washington Education Association recognized a history of systemic racism and disservice mm -hmm. to communities of color in the PK-12 schools uh, throughout the state. Um, and mm -hmm. they approached uh, our college, the College of Education, wanting us to, to conduct this study that involved consulting with community members of color to understand the levels and types of investments and policies needed to, to address the and eliminate um, the inequities and injustices in Washington school. So, so <laughs> a let's big go. call. <laughs> big call right. here, right? And so um, for us, you know, knowing the brilliance and the expertise of our Black, Indigenous, um, and other people of the global majority communities, right, um, who have and continue to, to successfully create and sustain places of belonging, learning, right. healing, and liberation for our people, our goal for this project was to center this beautiful self-determining work of local Black-led and other PGM orgs and community spaces. And to offer a vision um, of what learning spaces might look like when informed by and reconstructed after the hopes, dreams, and abolitionist work of Black and other PGM community members and organizations. Um, and so for me, uh, as a person of color in the college and 
pretty new to the Pacific Northwest at the time of this study, I was That's really right. at the beginning stages of forming local connections, right, with PGM community organizations. And so I knew like right off that I wanted and needed collaborators on this project, um, collaborators who had those established relationships uh, in the community. Right. And so I came to know Kayla, Caleb, and Jessica um, through a course that I taught and also had the privilege of serving as faculty advisor for the Critical Conversations Collective, which, which is uh, a bias for us group that they created and sustained um, to really help them as um, PhD students of color in a predominantly white institution. So from these connections and relationships, I gained knowledge about their work and um, formed a tremendous respect you know, for them as scholars who were engaged in beautiful work in PGM mm -hmm. uh, communities and organizations. And so I asked them to be co-researchers and together, we designed and carried out um, this research. Um, and then to speak about my relationship with um, The Root of Us, um, I learned about this organization through my own exploration, but also I was involved in another Black-led organization at the time that we actually write about in our report um, that came out mm -hmm. before this piece. And so it was there that I learned about Fresnel and The Root of Us, who I will call True um, for short. Um, and Fresnel is this amazing, brilliant, Black woman and veteran teacher mm. um, who has um, been teaching for over 30 years uh, in schools um, in the state of Washington and also has been a community educator that whole time. And so the Root of Us is an organization that supports the humanity, uh, healing and empowerment of its intergenerational members and participants, um, but especially its youth. And so my relationship uh, with Fresnel and the Wood of Us started off as an observer and admirer of the beautiful and impactful work that they were doing during the summer of 2020 through their virtual mm -hmm. rallies and meetings um, that were heavily focused on reimagining and improving school the schooling experiences of Black and other PGM uh, youth during and beyond the pandemic and remote learning. Mm -hmm. Um, and then later was introduced to Fresnel, though a mutual friend. And we um, basically, like our relationship has developed and continued um, uh, up to this day, right? I continue to um, have a, a relationship with Fresnel and the intro and also partnerships. Um, and I'll talk about uh, projects, um, additional projects that I've engaged in uh, with True yeah. later on. Um, beautiful, Shanae, thank you for that. Um, I really, I was resonating with um, the way that this was sort of a, it was a pedagogical and a relational story from the beginning with you all um, and some other folks. I know Jasmine Moore and maybe some other folks were part of that Critical Conversations Collective or are part of it. Um, and so just to think about um, starting learning in community together and then bringing together um, the ways that you had connected with various spaces and people um, in the broader city, right? In the broader, um, on these lands. And so I thought maybe if anybody else um, is thinking about um, some of these uh, organizations in particular that you learned from that you might like to maybe shout out or talk a little bit about. And I'm thinking about, and you started to kind of um, go there in some ways, Shanae, um, what were the roles or sets of relations or even the feeling of these community spaces? Um, if any of that um, resonates in a way that would be useful. So I don't know if, if another person um, with us might wanna just jump in and talk a little bit about um, those organizations or one of them. Um, and you could also talk a little bit about the project more broadly if you'd like. Yeah, um, I kind of wanna jump in and I want also Kayla to talk a little bit more about nurturing roots as well. Um, but just to talk about that feeling of relationship, um, you know, I, I think it's a good reminder of what we were experiencing during this time, right? We had mm -hmm. experienced COVID-19 pandemic and everybody was mandated to stay inside. You know, there was um, UW campuses were closed, like research That's projects. Right. Okay, we're not doing this anymore, right? And so I think like for us as as researchers who were deeply embedded in community what did that mean for us right and so that's right i think for speaking for myself and i think i i can say for all of us really it was an isolating time where i think we um 
continue to build and lean on community, whether that was mm. with each other, writing this paper, doing this work, you know, even though we were at a distance and on Zoom and trying to figure out like, oh, my my mic is muted and, you know, what do I do now? <laughs> um, but I, I think like it's, um, it's nice to reflect on that because um, I think for me personally, I just wanted to come in and be like, Shanae, how can I support these young people? Because I'm feeling very isolated. I know I want to work, right. continue my work with young people. And so um, Shanae introduced me to for now. And that's how I got in, introduced through the root of us. And it just kind of like snowballed, snowballed from there, which was, um, you know, what's on your minds, these young folks? Um, what's, what's, how are we talking about? How are we learning about systems of oppression? How are they in, impacting us um, right now during this time in, in the various ways that we're showing up? And so um, I think in, in terms of that feeling, Django, that you're asking, I think it was a combination of, I feel isolated. So how can I lean on community to do this together? Um, so, yeah. oh, that's that's beautiful. Kayla, did you want to follow up on that? And thank you, Jessica, for for kind of um, bringing us um, back to that time in a way, uh, mm -hmm. because things move and things continue to be so dire in so many ways. And um, just to kind of uh, bring us back in some way to what that feeling was. Yeah, Kayla. Yeah, um, I think that I connected to that within terms of uh, meeting nurturing roots. So I met um, Naima, who's the um, founder of Nurturing Roots um, and from a previous project um, and it was one of like the biggest memories I've had of her is first time meeting her she gave me the biggest hug ever and I was like <laughs> all right this is, <laughs> this is gonna work out um, but my people <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, and so when Shanae uh, invited us to this project um, my immediate thought was of Nurturing Roots and Naima um, and in previous conversations with Naima she had talked a lot about how interconnected community is and that support of community care um, and I you know through my time working with her I learned about how it incredibly involved she was in multiple efforts um, to support learning about health and wellness um, from an anti-colonial mm. perspective with local communities. And so Nurturing Roots itself um, that she runs um, uh, was a farm that had um, free produce for folks in the community um, that had community learning programs um, around sustainability and health. Um, mm. and, and there was just like this very clear love for more than humans. And so sh she had all these chickens, she had all these plants, and um, there was just really that nurturing yes. of um, land and community. Um, and, uh, as folks, uh, I think in Seattle are recognized that a lot, um, Nurturing Roots actually faced, um, forced displacement earlier, uh, last year, mm -hmm. um, because of predatory landlord practices. Um, and, but what's really cool is like Naima and her team have been continuing to work on a farm, a small, a farm space, um, at small axe farms in Woodenville. Um, and it's mm. still providing that produce is still providing educational workshops um, throughout Seattle. So um, it's really cool to see to to have seen her journey through all that. Right. And and just to think about um, what it means to continue this work um, in the face of like if you're if you're working on, you know, decolonial or anti-colonial health and well-being um, in a, uh, you know, city and society that's shaped by coloniality, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, what mm -hmm. it means to continue the work, but also to be able to, right? Um, I'm thinking of the Black Lives Memorial Garden and Black Star Farmers mm -hmm. here in the community, and that that garden was just, you know, came, uh, you know, about during that same summer, and, you know, that first garden, although they keep doing, continue to do so much beautiful work, you know, has been taken um, away, um, erased um, by the city as well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Caleb, anything that's um, coming up for you as you're 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 listening to um, folks share about you know this project, those mm -hmm. spaces and that time? Yeah, I think uh, I think what pops up for me is just the way that Kayla and I first went to nurturing roots during that summer and the abundance of people that were there and the intergenerational learning that was going on. Um, in that space and Kayla and I before we decided to to like work with Nurturing Roots for this project we were going there just to be around people and to like being that's right. with other people mm -hmm. right and so I think that's one of the things that like 
as far as like set of relations and building, like a lot of it comes about as like, well, I just want to be in relation with somebody or with this community and support the work that's going on. And so we would just go there and weed. And that was like our time outside during That's that right. summer to like feel safe and like fill our cup more or less. Um, and then we were like, oh, when we were talking with Naima about this project, she was all for it. And I think I've learned from Kayla and other folks here, like the the uh, offering of support and and like following through. I mean, that's how you also that's right. cultivate relations. I mean, mm -hmm. Naima, like I remember her specifically saying that like Kayla is one of the best community partners she's ever worked with because she always follows mm -hmm. through. So I think that's, that right. that's like just an ode to Kayla does always follow through. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I think that like alone is like a lesson um in how like these relations across all of these projects and things like that um have been made and sustained over six, seven years now, pretty much. So I think that that's that's pretty cool. And um yeah. I think, you know, what, what you're saying there, and um, I think, Jess, in some ways, you got got us started thinking about that thread, um, but what you're saying about um, relations over time, I think, is also so important to this, the, the, the idea of an elsewhere or an otherwise um, in teaching and learning um, and in, you know, so-called research or, you know, learning in community with others, um, um, hopefully toward, um, you know, the world we need. Uh, but how important that is. So you said, you know, before we decided or thought about this as a project, it was a place that sustained us, right? Mm -hmm. And then the the ask isn't, can I, um, can I, you know, extract something, but rather, how can we continue this relationship in a way that um, mm -hmm. can share it with others mm -hmm. and can amplify amplify sort of the beautiful work that others might be able to learn alongside um, where the, wherever they are. So I just really, I really appreciate that. Um, anything coming up for others before we kind of move to another um, very related kind of kind of uh, keep leaning in on this? The, you know, so specifically, and it won't be a surprise in, a, in some sense, um, since you were just sharing uh, these, I think. Um, you write about that there were three themes that kind of came up from um, you know, being in these spaces, talking with people, doing surveys, um, trying to kind of understand, you know, what was teaching and learning? Um, what was the vibe, right? Um, what was belonging, healing, and liberation? And so you write that those three themes were, quote, soulful vibes cultivated through food, music, and artwork. Also healing vibes, that allowed participants to exhale and find refuge from white supremacy and surveillance. And then also abolitionist vibes, evident in knowledge sharing, freedom dreaming, and calls for collective action. And so if anybody wants to kind of take one of those, um, I know they're so interrelated, uh, and so we don't necessarily have to keep them um, apart in any way, um, but if anybody wants to take one of those and just um, think with it for a moment, um, offer any examples of, of, of where you saw or felt it um, or heard about it from others. Um, Kayla, you want to start maybe with yeah, that one? That sounds good. Yeah. So I can, um, I can start with the soulful vibes. Um, so, you know, as, as we described in the paper, you know, all of these three vibes are like feelings and their energy and it's like a life force. So like you said, uh, it all is interconnected and it, it blurs. There's no like clear-cut lines um, to what this particular vibe looks like or feels right. like. But I um, I would start off with saying that soulful vibes, like I see it as like a very warm and cozy vibe. It's one that's validating. It's one that feeds your soul. Um, and so we describe mm -hmm. this particular vibe to encompass a few things. So one is that um, that we can tell when going into a particular space, a community space, that it's owned and run by people of the global majority. Um, and so this can be evident from the music that they're playing, um, the fact that there are predominantly black and brown folks in this space. Um, mm -hmm. And then we're also thinking about like visual aesthetics too. Like we can see artwork um, with black and brown people at the center of focus um, in the art. Um, we can see like cultural patterns in the architecture. Um, and then I also want to add like, mm this vibe also bleeds into the abolitionist vibe, but 
Um, soulful vibes are also cultivated through the activism that exists in the spaces, um, whether that's like through posters uh, with a very clear stance on uh, political stance on collective liberation uh, and abolition. Um, but I think kind of all encompassing soulful vibes are um, these, this, it's felt when there's ample access um, to our specific cultural foods, arts, music, um, and very clear liberatory political understandings. And that all of that is at the center um, and not just mm. these, like additional um, add-ons to the space. In a sense, it's it's the entire vibe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, right. Also, you said it's a life force. Um, I love thinking about that as um, as what teaching and learning um, should be and feel like. Mm -hmm. um, it should be a life force. It should it, it should help us live um, mm -hmm. good in relation and in community with others and all beings, right? And so I just love that um, idea of the life force. Anybody else um, want to kind of move from there yeah, yeah. jessica I'll, did you yeah go for it yeah yeah i'll talk about um healing vibes um this is definitely my jam <laughs> and so <I> think <laughs> for us like when we um you know worked with um folks on this project a lot that was coming up was this idea of healing right and i think healing can be a hard word to describe right and so the way we kind of encompassed healing was really thinking about this like breath of fresh air right you get a mm. chance to reflect to reset um in in different of these chosen spaces right that folks were talking about um Mm -hmm. particularly being able to escape from these, um, you know, racist and oppressive, uh, oppressive um, um, interactions with folks that they were having right. systems that are at play. And so, um, you know, in, in our paper, one of the things that we talked about um, that the, that the pandemic really gave folks, students, particularly a break from this um, quote, spirit murdering, um, that they were experiencing in schools regularly, right? right. Um, so in in thinking about this, I think the pandemic really allowed for this slowdown of, okay, what do I need? Because I've been constantly feeling like under attack. I've been constantly feeling like I'm on the go. I have to escape. I have to do all these things just to survive, right? That's right. But what, what are these chosen spaces that I'm leaning into to actually feel like I can heal, like I can do this healing work um, because we've been experiencing it. Our, our communities have been experiencing it for decades, right? And so how can we actually um, have a space or find a space in this um, that feels like refuge, that feels like I can do this healing work um, together? And so, um, you know, places like Nurturing Roots, places like The Root of Us were these chosen spaces that folks were were leaning into. Um, places like the Station Coffee Shop, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the really cool things that I want to mention here about this um, healing theme too is that we all got to experience these spaces, right? Like, I think we all also felt um, and continue to feel, you know, particularly I'm I'm referring to the station coffee shop, but like, I think yeah. we can all agree this is a space that we feel is healing to us, right? Like Kayla was saying, we see the artwork, we see the representation, we see, we feel those vibes um, when we walk into certain spaces. Um, and I think that then invokes the healing in us that we can do uh, collectively. You were you were so on point there, Jess, that um, I think we were all like, yeah, totally. We're feeling healed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a healing moment. Just those memories. That's something to think about, too, the way places stay with us and the mm -hmm. way we carry them. Right. And so even as you were um, sort of um, reminding folks of what it actually felt like, um, uh, we feel that in our bodies and we're reminded of the possibility um, and reminded of the reality and reminded that it can happen again, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, Caleb, you wanna you wanna follow up at all on the, the abolitionist vibes or or anything that's been shared? Yeah, I, I, I do wanna note that the, the station is, every time I go in there, I see Shanae. <laughs> you know, like every single time I walked over there, I would see Shanae right in reviewing somebody's paper, reviewing Kayla's dissertation, you know, like doing something. 
<laughs> now it's all coming out. <laughs> yeah. And every time that Jess comes up to Seattle, they stop mm -hmm. by to get the gravy, yeah. the biscuits and gravy. Yes. And so, you know, I'll go to the station if I'm really like feeling social more than to do anything else. So I think that that's interesting. Kind of fills up the or connects to the healing vibes too. Is like <laughs> if I want to see people and like I need, I feel like I need to see somebody. Like that's where I go, you know, if I want to like have a real random organic, like everyday conversation with somebody and just like even the baristas and the owners, um, Lu uh, Luis and Leona, like that's where I'm trying to go, you know. And mm -hmm. so I think that's that's part of like the because mm -hmm. we don't have to fake, you know, because mm -hmm. like, moving into like the abolitionist vibes, that's like an ethic and a way of moving. And it's not just mm -hmm. um as some of the folks in the in the paper noted, like it's not just fuck the police. It's not just like abolishing prisons. It's more of mm -hmm. it's more of a way that we move, and and I think the station kind of embodies that um, movement through the the actualizing of like talk walking the walk and talking the talk, um, which mm -hmm. we see often is kind of a lot of people can talk the things, but they don't actually do it um, in their daily, and the station really shows up that way. I um, mean, the people who engage in that space too. So you know that the people that are going to be in there as well are, are are tapping into that healing and and soulful vibes. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. and When you so. said, "Oh, go ahead, Shanae. You want to talk a little bit about uh, the station or the fact that you're going there right after this interview?" Or, <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Yeah. Wait, Caleb, were you about to say something else? Oh no, no. I just you said, um, yeah. Just hence you being there all the time yeah. is like yeah. all the all the all the different vibes intertwined uh -huh. yeah yeah I, I'm I'm remembering one time I was at the station I was in line behind this family but I just noticed the cute baby <laughs> and was like mm. you know talking to the baby oh you're so beautiful what's your name and then Jessica turns around like <laughs> so at this point, oh wow no way she, I think she had already moved out of Seattle right. at that point. So it's so funny, you know, that I'm just like doting on this beautiful child. And then it turns out, oh, this is Jessica's baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, but something else I would say about the abolitionist uh, vibes. So I think about the work of True, um, which was the, uh, their work that summer that was really heavily focused on reimagining um, and engaging in actions to transform schools. And so in the paper, we mm -hmm. talk about these two virtual rallies that they put on. Right. And the first one drew like about roughly 550 uh, participants, right? These were like mostly community members of color from all levels, like families, um, educators, students, um, and students having a, a, leader, a leadership role in that first uh, rally. Um, leading the breakout sessions, right, that were focused on restorative, restorative, restorative justice and mental health mm -hmm. and healing. Also, they were talking about uh, Black history and pan ethnic uh, studies curriculum, um, and also supporting students with disabilities and, and by multilingual learners. Um, mm -hmm. And they also were responsible, so they completely like designed and facilitated that second virtual rally of the summer that drew still a large number, 140 yeah. uh, participants, with the focus uh, really being on school segregation um, due to tracking and exclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and from this work that True was doing that summer, they came out with this um, this video called I Can Return to School When, where they interviewed like all these different so community um, members, right? Including students, including uh, teachers, including um, uh, families, right? And from that, um, they shared like some key demands that these community members were asking for. And one of them being an ethnic studies curriculum that features black and PGM authors and a curriculum that disrupts the whitewashing and glorification of colonialism, capitalism, and imperialism. Um, right. They were also, you know, calling for an end to racially biased and charged policing and disciplinary practices within schools that we know disproportionately affect, affect Black, Brown, Indigenous, you know, people of color. Um, and this included really calling for the removal of these student resource officers or, or campus police from the schools. They were also calling mm -hmm. for anti-racist training for all everybody in the school, right? For white teachers and students. Uh, and then lastly, really thinking about mental health, 
calling for the hiring of more counselors and mental health health spe specialists, um, particularly those of color and from their communities, right? Um, and so, yeah, there was some really, really powerful uh, things happening uh, that summer around abolition. You, you, I mean, oh man, there, there, there really were, right? Um, I remember that Miriam Kaba piece that came out like, you know, massive um, mainstream newspaper whose name I won't mention, um, who said uh, that was that was basically, um, yes, we really do mean defund the police, you know, um, but mm -hmm. it was that it was that scale. And so, um, Shanae, what you bring us into there and this pro this project um, that True did, I, uh, you know, I can return to school when um, are all these pieces um, that young people and families knew, know, have always known in a sense, um, but that we're calling for, right? And you all end this, um, you know, end this piece in many ways with um, some radical, I think what you call radical imagining, um, where you're thinking about, um, you know, uh, schools that, so Caleb, when you said, that's where I want to go when I want to see people, when I want to feel social, it, it draws me to it, right? Um, it's not a surprise that um, school is usually not the place that draws us in that way. That's like, God, I just got to be there, right? Um, uh, in, that, in that same way. And so, in fact, you say where schools can shout in the article, you say schools could shout, you know, you belong here. Like that, that, that schools could sh kind of shout that or communicate that in various ways. And so... Um, Maybe you could, and I, and I think in some ways, Shanae, you know, the young people, the families, they, sh they shared those with us. And I think that, you know, many of us, you know, um, feel those um, in, in similar ways. But um, if anything else is coming up for, for any of you around that, uh, that dreaming that you do, you know, to, to think of Robin D.G. Kelly's, you know, understanding of freedom dreaming, but that mm -hmm. freedom dreaming that you kind of do there at the end, um, what what are what are the the sort of facets or components or elements of these dreams um, for school spaces um, for mm -hmm. each of you? If you could just you know shout one or two out if you'd like or or in any way share. Caleb, you want to start that one maybe? Yeah, um, I think a lot of us do in, engage in these this like radical freedom dreaming in different ways in our work, and so I think that's. It's, and a lot of us don't work in, like directly in schools, but work with schools and a part of schools are in out of school learning spaces where students mm -hmm. opt to be in those chosen spaces instead of doing stuff in school. Um, right. And so I think one of the main ones that kind of pops up to me is um, like a generative space for students to dream up what their learning spaces can look like. Um, and so that goes back to like the aesthetics. So it's kind of like radical or in my work, it, it's called like insurgent aesthetics um, and mm -hmm. the different ways that students can design their learning environments so that they want to learn there, um, if that makes sense. So schools can shift Absolutely. more centered around what the students want and within the confines of, you know, what where a lot of us are working in in education spaces, um, particularly yeah. in schools. Um, but I think that's a big shift that students are calling for and have been calling for before the pandemic and even through the pandemic and things like that um, and ongoing. So, um, yeah. So. Absolutely. And I know in your work, Caleb, that's, that's, that's so central, like, you know, asking that question of young people and families and community members, you know, what should this space look and feel like, um, including architecturally, how should it be designed? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, any, anybody else kind of want to talk a little bit about what's coming up for them around, um, around these dreams? Um, yeah. Oh. No, go ahead, Jess. Or you should name. I love it though. If ever you know, if you're like dreaming, I'm here. <laughs> I'll I'll just go really quickly and say that I think one of the things for me being um in the field of of social work and at the intersections of social work and ethnic studies is really thinking about how do we um how do we make a space that's healing, right? How do we are how are we able to center like our mental, physical, spiritual well-being um, within the space, because oftentimes that's not always the case. And I think we um, resort to things like um, um, mm -hmm. police or the, um, what are they called, school mm -hmm. resource officers, you know, on campus. And, 
you know, yes, we can get more mental health counselors, but, you know, are they actually centering community or are they just part of the the surveillance and the, the, con the control, right. you know? And so are they doing the students justice? And so I think really asking ourselves, like, what what could that space look like for in schools where it does center our physical, mental and spiritual well-being? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Kayla or Shanae? Go ahead, Kayla. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think along the lines with what Jess is saying, too, it's there it's you know representation only goes so far there also needs to be that representation with politics and, and like um like that's the, right commitments yes. right commitments right um and so one of the cool things from that we learned from um the surveys and the interviews with folks is that they we, we asked folks like where what are these spaces in seattle but some people named people and i thought that that was really cool mm. like um uh chef Tarek was on there um mm -hmm. uh I think it's DJ who cooks, right? Mm -hmm. I think yeah, getting that yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. but everyone knows Chef Tarek. Everyone knows, mm -hmm. like Caleb mentioned, everyone and 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 um we all mentioned everyone knows the station, everyone knows the owners, at least knows of the owners of the station. And I think that that like mm -hmm. the fact that they also embody those vibes too is another like really important piece when we do that radical dreaming is like we don't just want this like representation of um people in the space, but it's like are they practicing um, those community values in this space as well. Mm -hmm. So crucial. Shanae? Yeah. yeah. And um, before I, I share like one of those dreams, I, I do want to emphasize that in addition to, so that section we basically wrote as informed by all that we learned, right, from these community uh -huh. members. But we were also drawing from our theoretical framework, right? The way we theorize a vibe as being a life force um, and life right. giving, giving uh, when the vibe is right, right? Um, we were drawing from abolitionist teaching, right? Which um, uh, Love and others have defined as uh, involving revolutionary dreams of freedom and critical and imaginative, imaginative dreams of collective resistance that are grounded in critiques of injustice, right? Um, mm. And from that, like we went into Freedom Dream, and we know Freedom Dream builds off of the work of Kelly. Um, Love has also talked about Freedom Dreaming. Um, these uh, scholars, uh, Neil and Dunn, right, define it as a mm -hmm. practice that offers liberatory space to imagine a world once injustices are eradicated and our full humanity is realized. Right. So yeah, so drawing from these frameworks, right, and also thinking about all that we learn, right. This is this is how we came about like what was shared in that last section of the paper. Um, and I think about um, Caleb's uh, point about talking to students, right? Students are often those voices that are not heard, that are ignored, that are not even considered, you know, to be, that they need to be at the table, right? And part of the conversation. But I also think about families, right? So right along with students, like we need to be learning mm -hmm. and listening to and really having a, authentic partnerships and relationships with families and community members, right? They need to be at the seat of the table when we're thinking about hiring, when we're thinking about curriculum redesign, when we're thinking about prof professional development for teachers, mm -hmm. right? Um, when we're thinking about policies that need to be like thrown out, right? Um, and in and, and creating more equitable, inclusive um, and just uh, policies. And so, yeah, so that's one of the things I, I also wanted to offer. Well, I, I, one of the things that I really appreciate about what you all are sharing um, and kind of bringing us back to kind of thinking about abolitionist uh, thinking, dreaming, doing, um, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about abolition as a presence. And what you all are talking about is, uh, is not the absence of school, but the presence of the schools that love us mm -hmm. um, or the presence of education spaces that love us. Uh, and so just to kind of um, conclude our, our conversation here today, um, I'm thinking about, you know, back to kind of where we started, back to that summer of 2020 when you were doing this work. And I remember um, the, the radical archivist and literary, uh, Black literary scholar and MacArthur genius, um, Sadia Hartman, she wrote that summer, um, shared that summer that she felt that, quote, there was a clarity of vision that would not be lost from that summer, that something happened in that summer that that um, as we went forward um, would stay with us. And in a lot of ways, I'm feeling that as I'm reading and then I'm as I'm hearing you. And I'm also wondering, you know, here three years later, 
about that clarity of vision, about where we are, where our dreams are, where these community spaces are. Kayla, you had shared, you know, uh, uh, you know, about the need to kind of move and um, and being, um, you know, um, erased, displaced. Um, I'm thinking about this time of ongoing, you know, climate catastrophe. Um, I'm thinking about um, the continued pandemic. I'm thinking about, you know, genocidal conflicts from Sudan to Congo, uh, to the Congo, to Palestine. I'm thinking about emboldened white supremacy, right? I'm thinking about all of these, but I'm also thinking about the ongoing beautiful resistance and living of people of the global majority um, and, and the spaces that, that sustain us. So, if there's anything that anybody would like to say, just in terms of a lesson from this project that you are carrying forward in your current work or your current living or your current organizing or when you're on the streets, in the classroom, whatever, wherever it is, right? Uh, that would be, that would be, I think, maybe a, an important way um, to send us off. So if anybody has anything they'd like to kind of say about that. Um, I'll start us off and I'll just say that I think for me, um, that time was a very isolating time for many reasons, um, including, you know, the pandemic and being mm -hmm. away from community, um, working with, you know, researchers um, who I won't mention that were, you right. know, very oppressive. And so I think for me, like one of the things that I have reflected on over the years is that I can't do this work of justice, liberation and healing without community. Um, community always has to be at the center of everything I do, you know, so when I think of folks making policies that um, solo policies without the community involvement, you know, I think about how um, infuriating that is to me and yeah. how I how we really leaned on each other during this time as a collective, as a group. Um, with the not only the communities that we were working with, um, but with each other, right? And I think mentioned mm -hmm. um, CCC earlier, you know, um, for us when we were um, PhD students, like that really was a, a necessary time in our lives that I think just fed our souls so much, you know, and I think really um, made us an even stronger group. Um, and so I say that because I think now as, um, as a professor, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think I'm challenged with different things. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I won't go into detail, but, you know, I recently mm -hmm. had an incident happen where, you know, a student was outwardly upset towards me um, in the classroom um, for mm -hmm. giving time and attention to Palestine, right, to giving time right. and attention to people who are experiencing genocide. And, you know, I felt very alone. I felt I felt yeah. like that place that I was in 2020, right? Um, but then I remembered the community that I have, right? The community of people that I lean on. And so they reminded me of why I do this work. And I think it, it was a reminder back then too of why we need to keep doing this work um, as uh, people of color, as people of you know the global majority, um, but especially as women of color, right? Um, mm -hmm. In academia, um, in a place that is oftentimes not welcoming and I constantly feel like, you know, we're under attack. And so I think this idea of centering community um, in everything that we do in all aspects of life, um, whether that's in academia or me as a mother, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think I'll, I'll leave that there, but yeah. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, Shanae, are you, are you thinking of maybe sharing something? Yep. Um, actually, I, have, I know you're asking for one, but I, I have a few. Um, and and the first being um, or lesson for me has been to continue to frequent and support these Black and PGM uh, community spaces that continue to support and sustain PGM community members, mm -hmm. right? So the station mm -hmm. has come up <laughs> and I think about the station and how, you know, a big chunk of, you know, this writing took place there, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the station being this black and brown owned um, coffee shop, you know, that one of our participants um, uh, named as fucking magic, right? For its mm -hmm. embodiment of all the life-giving and soul-filling elements that PGM community members named and valued, right? So the, the station was, you know, one of the most frequently named places of belonging by community members. Um, 
also I've maintained a relationship and continue to partner with Fresnel Miller and the root of us, right? Um, Fresnel uh, Miller has come in and facilitated um, healing and learning circles and various classes, right? And students, you know, in evaluations have named that session as one of their favorites. So mm -hmm. like Fresnel has been doing circle like since she was a child. Um, and mm -hmm. so, yeah. I also think about like a recent um, project um, that I've been working on, on integrating environmental justice uh, in my social studies methods class. So for now, and, and the root of us were partners uh, on that project. Um, and then this project, and to your um, question, like this project and the clarity of vision that it offered, that it pers persists mm. in this current climate, right? And that it inspires me as I witness the courageous organizing and solidarity That's work right. of students of colleagues, of community members of color regarding the current genocide that is happening in Palestine, right? I'm also inspired by scholars like Michelle Alexander, who mm -hmm. spoke out very early on on, on the atrocities uh, that were happening and is happening in Palestine, right? Think about we're just coming off the MLK um, uh, holiday, right? And thinking about a talk that um, Alexander gave, uh, she gave opening remarks at the Palestinian right. Festival of Literature on November 1st of 2023, inciting a very powerful speech that Dr. Um, King gave um, in 1967, condemning the war in Vietnam. Alexander stated that our conscience must leave us no other choice when the oppressed, the poor, and the weak are under attack, when their homes are stolen and demolished, when they are forced to migrate and to live in unspeakable conditions, in open air prisons and uh, concentration camps, perpetually as refugees under occupation, we must speak, right? And right. I, mean, I consider myself a, a critical scholar of color, right? Um, and I discuss settler, colonial, settler colonialism in my classes. I talk about and I center the self-determining and advocacy and justice work of Black, Indigenous, and other historically and currently marginalized communities in both mm -hmm. my teaching and my writing, right? So I could not help like, like just but teach about Palestine, right? And dedicated a, a session um, last quarter in my social studies methods course um, to teaching, right, about the, the over a century long history of conquest, settlement, uh, displacement, um, and violence uh, against the That's Palestinian right. people. And mm -hmm. I've also like written a piece, um, a practitioner piece on why we must teach on Palestine, right, connecting the past to present in a social studies methods course uh, that I'm currently um, looking for the right place, right, to submit. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, so, I cannot wait to learn with that, Shanae. Yeah. Wow, yeah. So, so do my my teaching, do my writing, like I really aim to inspire the students who are basically educators, right, in my class. I That's want right. them to challenge this whitewashing of the curriculum. I want them um, to challenge, right, the silencing, the silencing, the marginalization and the misrepresentation um, of the perspectives, experiences, histories, and collective resistance, right, of multiply marginalized communities of color. Right. right. So this is what. Um, I learn and what continues to like inspire me during these times. What the one of the things that you're sharing there, thank you so much, Shanae, um, that's resonating also with what you were sharing, Jess, is um that the that that we are not alone even when we feel like we're alone. And then um the multiple ways that we're in community, um, in in when we're in, even and also when we're in classrooms. Right. And so um, and that the separation between classroom and community, um, it, you know, isn't or shouldn't be um, uh, what it sometimes feels like or is presented as. And so you, you're giving these examples, Jess, of you a, a moment of feeling alone, um, doing necessary teaching about Palestine, but then re recognizing, oh, I'm never alone. Um, and then Shanae giving this example of um, when community members come into class. And suddenly, um, those those you know really false and damaging um, and designed um, barriers are kind of broken down. Um, Kayla or Caleb, any any final words? Didn't jump in. Um, so I think uh, you know I'm thinking about the lessons that that I've learned from this particular project, um, and a big one for me was uh, on community care. Uh, so I think a lot about like Adrian Marie Brown's concept of fractals of the whole. Um, essentially fractals being like a small rep small scale representation of the whole. Um, and so about a year before the project started, um, I gained like this really great community with uh, folks here. Um, and 
I I would I think that like I think we could I could say this for all of us that um we cultivated this mini community of these like three major vibes. Uh, we you know we attended community <clears throat> events together. We shared meals um, of food um, that reminded us of home. Um, we would ha- talk for hours <laughs> about our experiences as uh, people with global majority. Um, we would we would talk for hours, freedom dreaming um, about what we wanted for ourselves and our and our communities. Um, and so when we engaged in this particular project, it was really cool to see that on a larger scale. Um, That's and it's like like wow, there really is this like shared experience of uh, people with global majority in Seattle. Um, and like I said, you know, we all know the station, we all know nurturing roots. Um, and and it was through these like spaces that was very evident that um, they the folks that were creating um, you know spaces like the station nurturing roots um, that they were showing up for community. And then at the same time, like the the folks that they were serving and 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 the community members that were would frequent these places also showed up for them, um, mm-hmm. such as like with nurturing roots when they were um, facing um, displacement. Um, and through like mutual aid programs and things like that. Um, but I, and then, you know, I think in that lesson of community care, we're also thinking a lot about like, we show up for each other. Like we're the ones that keep are keeping each other safe. Um, and so that's like that, that's through COVID that's through being in a police state. Um, that's through being silenced at in our workplaces to, for being vocal about free Palestine. Um, and I think a lot about like right now, um, like Yemeni freedom fighters and how they're showing that's up right. in Palestine and how like that's the that's the love we want like that's the community care on a global scale um that I think um we can be modeling in our individual like everyday relationships with one another wow Kayla one of the things that you were sharing there um uh about um that you all felt it um uh, and then um, went searching or um, were reminded or knew of other places where it existed, I think is a really important lesson for kind of this idea of an educational otherwise. When you feel it and you know it's possibility, you know it's got to be happening somewhere else. Um, I felt it other places because I know we're all thinking of, you know, community spaces in the places where we grew up or where we have um, family connections too. I know that you know that um, we're focusing on Seattle here, but we're 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 all thinking of these other um, mm-hmm. places where this exists too. Um, Caleb, yeah, I think to close, I a, a lot of this project reminds me of like, what's the role of the researcher in these movements? What's the role of mm-hmm. the academic and the scholar in these movements? Um, and it's really to like show up, connect. At least for me, um, to show up, mm-hmm. connect and like make space because we carry so many privileges and like our job is not just the ivory tower. Like Mm -hmm. that is a, that is where our check, that's who signs our checks. (laughs) And the rest of our time should be with people in community and building this care, um, showing up in these spaces, helping cultivate and nurture these spaces and continue to tell the stories of these spaces um, to shift the paradigm of of where we've been and, and where, and where we're going. Um, like currently I'm on Tongva land at UCLA and going to talk in my friend's class about this paper actually. And he's teaching about right community transformative community engaged research. Um, and I just get to like talk a little bit about, and he's assigned this class or this paper for this class. Um, and he's a Palestinian scholar and he's been experiencing a number of different things in different ways, for but sure. we've been in community about like, okay, how do we show up across these different spaces and settings as educators as researchers and as friends um and mm-hmm. family right um so all these different identities are just interwoven and so i think that is another thing that we can do things differently um as researchers and as academics um by being able to do this work so that's that's something that i'm taking away quite often absolutely you reminded me of that um gloria latson billing two years ago um uh shared you know um the institution has no capacity to love us back um mm-hmm. but of course we do and mm-hmm. spaces mm-hmm. do the land does mm-hmm. and so um you know being in you know in constant um in in search of and enjoying you know that love um where we find it and trying to grow it so i want to thank each of you for your time today i know i said we'd be more like a half hour and we got carried away <laughs> um but this was really um really gorgeous and and necessary and i continue to learn in community with all of you, hopefully people that are listening or watching 
um, can take this um, into their own work or it resonates with work that you're already doing. I wanna thank our research assistant, Seattle Padmore, as well as Caleb Albright for his production work. Uh, as many have said before, another world is possible and another educational world is possible. So peace and blessings, everyone. Thank you.